Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. Thanks so much for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to draw your attention to The fact that we have two more opportunities for one-on-one personal coaching for the month of February. Uh, If you think you know someone or you yourself would like to reach optimal levels in your health, in your career, in your mindset, or in your relationships, please don't hesitate. Reach out to rabbirupp at gmail.com. Imagine a quarter century in leadership. Today we have the tremendous privilege of having Rabbi Stephen Berg who, after Harvard Business School, became the international director of NCSY, uh, created such unbelievable programs like the JSU, the Jewish Student Union, which is affecting thousands and thousands of Jewish high school students in public schools across the country, and recently took over as the CEO of Asia Torah, an international movement dedicated to servicing the Jewish community. Now, Rabbi Berg has a plethora of different leadership experiences, and we drilled down to some very practical brass tacks, if you would, techniques, what gets him going, what keeps him up at night, and how he addresses challenges on an international level. So with no further ado, Rabbi Stephen Berg. Growing up, was leadership part of what you did and part of what you saw as a young child? Yeah, my father is a rabbi in Brooklyn. Of a, he's a pulpit rabbi of a synagogue. He's actually just celebrated his 40th year there. So he's been there for quite a while. It's funny, he's been in one place 40 years. I keep jumping. So it's, a, you know, maybe I'm, just, maybe I'm just a reaction. But in the synagogue, the shul that I grew up in with my father, the kids were always put to work. And I always tell people that, like, anytime, like, the sidurim need to be changed over on the high holidays for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, or things had to happen, my father would like get the kids, we used to joke that, you know, there were like child labor, you know, laws, <laughs> violations in, in my shul. But it was an amazing thing. Like we were the ones that set up child shudders. We were the ones that would shove chairs and, and, and tables. And we, you know, so I think, you you know, leadership starts with rolling up your sleeves and actually doing stuff. Um, and, and I think that that for me was a really good beginning into understanding, uh, you know, my father, who was a shul rabbi, gets to shuls a half an hour before shul starts in the mornings. And I remember when I would go to other shul, and I see rabbis kind of run in by Brooke Shemar, and I was like, I just didn't get it. Like, you know, I just thought being a rabbi meant you got there a half hour early. And, and the reason he'd get there was to be able to schmooze and talk with all the people who are in India and be there and communicate with them. So I thought I was pretty lucky to have had uh, that background. What does Jewish leadership mean to you, both in terms of the, obviously, the, your own experience, the fact that you've worked under quite a few big leaders, and also that you've studied this extensively for much of your career? I think Jewish leadership is, it's about, like I said before, kind of rolling up your sleeves and doing the things that other people don't necessarily want to do. I think it's so many times, like the leaders are the ones that, that make things happen, they get things done. You know, I had a very, very close friend of mine in Germany, and he told me that, as he saw it, there were three types of Jewish leaders. They were the leaders when he had an issue in Germany, he'd call, and they wouldn't return his call. At least he knew where, where, you know, where he was holding. They would be there for him. Then there were leaders that he'd call, and they'd be like, oh, no problem. We'll help you. And then they were just never available to do anything. So then there were leaders that would take his call and actually did something. And I think that for Jewish leaders, the real leaders are the ones that will roll up their sleeves and help, even if it's not their project or their issue. You know, and, but because... They've done so much work in the community. They have great connections, but yet they're willing to, to help out all kinds of other parts uh, of the Jewish community. I think those are like the real leaders. Besides your father and uh, Judge Butler, who are some of your biggest mentors? I always say that if you, if you turn to the Bible, my biggest hero is, uh, is David Amalek because in the beginning of his story, his father-in-law tried to kill him. At the end of his story, his son tried to kill him. In the middle of the police didn't try to kill him. And he still got a lot accomplished. I think, you know, in terms of that, you know, if you want to understand Jewish leadership, that's a, that's a great window. I, you know, for me, there have been different mentors and different people that I've seen throughout my career. I think that I'm at Asia Tower now, but I think Ravnoff Weinberg um, has been someone very, very inspirational for me um, in that the fact that when he started, people didn't think outreach was important. They didn't think it was possible. And I think the great leaders are those that when everyone's saying, you know, there's no way, no how, it's impossible, they're able to make things happen. In my personal life, it's uh, Rav Sabolowski, who's my personal Rebbe, someone who is is just there constantly 
to answer any question for anyone. I mean, I've sat with him and people call him constantly. He doesn't even know who's calling, but he's always there to, to available to give the answers to them. When you took over at Asia Torah, it's a huge mission, you know, about the, about the Jewish people. How did you identify what you wanted to accomplish first, and how are you going about implementing that as in, in terms of execution? Yeah, that's a great question. That, that's the question that I wrestled with coming here. You know, it's, it's an interesting organization that it's got a 40 year history. So when you take over an organization like that, you have to be very, very respectful of all the steps that got it to where it is today. On the other hand, you need to understand that the world's changed and some of your methodologies and the things that you do need to change. You know, for me, it was, it was taking a look at an organization which had fought in the 70s and 80s to put outreach on the map. It was an organization that had picked up people backpacking through Europe off the coattail and brought them into our, our great building. And it was this realization that now, today, the Orthodox world accepts outreach. Uh, and not only does it accept it, it, it encourages it. And to understand that that changed, and also the fact that backpackers through Europe aren't showing up at the Western Wall anymore. And I think the intellectual aptitude of, of most of the people that we're engaging with, not to say that people aren't as smart, but they're not as intellectually curious. You know, most people walk in and they, you know, they've got their phone and they're, you know, they're staring at their phone and just to get their, their attention. It's hard. Like one of the, Mati Berger is one of the great, great teachers here. He said that years ago, we would like fight with people about whether God exists or not. And people didn't want to give in because the second they gave in that God existed, then they felt like they had to go and do stuff. So today, guys on his phone, he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, there's God, no problem. What else? You're not getting that intellectual pushback. Again, it doesn't mean people are not as smart. I think people are incredibly smart and intelligent today. It's just the way people process things are just different. So, you know, when you have an institution at H, we have to look at the world a little bit differently and understand that perhaps what got us to this point is not going to get us to the next point. And that's why we're working on all kinds of approaches that are going to speak to the people. And, and it's like social media today. One of the things I tell people all the time is, yeah, you know, we, we were built as an organization pulling people off the Western Wall and inviting them to come to a class. But today, there's literally, you know, I don't think that there's a Jew in the world that we couldn't hope to touch them through, through social media. You know, and I think this Shabbos project by Warren Goldstein, who is, by the way, one of my heroes, uh, where Warren Goldstein basically proved that. You know, he had he had 8,000 locations for the Shabbos Project. Now, sometimes, you know, we have a tendency to get cynical and sarcastic. And I said, let's say he's lying about 75% of that. He still has 2,000 locations. I think that that's, you know, to show that you can inspire people from South Africa across the globe, I think he basically showed everyone that, that the world's changed and how you reach people's change. One of the things that is so impressive about what you've done, perhaps you could provide some insight in, is have you gone essentially, like you said, into a new organization that has a 40 year history. You're talking to people that have been doing what they've been doing very successfully, changing the world for decades. How did you navigate the experience of being the new guy on the block and still trying to build that level of leadership and to essentially you know, change the way that things were done in a certain sense to make it more up to date with the, with the modern challenges? Yeah, look, I think anytime you come into any organization, you have to be very wary and very careful not to come in with a chip on your shoulder. You know, the first thing you need to do is, is build a relationship with the folks that you're, you're working with. And to me, I grew up in NCSY, so to speak. I spent 22 years there. And it's, the cultures are very similar, similar to NCSY and Ashitara. So for me, it was really about showing them that I understood where they were coming from, understood where they wanted to get to, and not coming in and, and tinkering with stuff that was working. And so, look, I think my style is, in general, is, I'm not a micromanager, but I just need micro information. Like I'm not gonna tell everyone what they need to be doing, but I need to know what's going on. And I think when people understand that you're not a micromanager, you have the ability to let them in their space be creative and do what they need to do. So and I think people people react really positively to that. You know, one of the things when you have the difference between running a local shop and in, in a national or international shop is that ability to not dictate and micromanage every move a person makes, to say this is the space to operate in right? But these are some of the things that we really kind of want to see. And when you can do that kind of yin yang, then people, people respond to that. You know, it, it's, they understand that the guy's not trying to take away what's mine. The guy's not trying to, 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 you know, turn this into something it's not, but he does want to win. And I find that the culture of Ishatora is that these people that have gone through Ishatora for 40 years, they, they, they want to win. They want to build a basic make dish. They want Mashiach to come. They want to bring Jews back. They want to win. And if they see a winning formula, that is proven it may work, then they're willing to get on board. When you are, for yourself, it's, it's amazing you have all this energy and you found leadership as a, I guess you can say as a life mission early. What was some of the biggest challenges personally to 
adopt and to grow and to develop? Did you start wanting to kind of not run the world, but you know, did you start having this, these massive, massive goals initially? Did you want to run something small? And what parts of yourself were you working on to make yourself better for the job? Look, I think the one thing that surprises most people when they're young are the politics they're involved in the Jewish community. You know, I've done a lot of lobbying in my career, and I remember being in, in Albany and sitting with one of the officials up there. And he was telling me that when he got there, he was a Russian Jew, and he'd spent a lot of time in the Jewish community. And then he decided to run for office, and he, he wound up going to Albany. And he said when he got there, they said to him, like, wow, you're really amazed at the politics. He said, are you kidding me? He said, compare the Jewish community. Albany's a joke, you know? <laughs> And um, so I think that in, in our community, in the Jewish community, sometimes the politics are very rough. Rav Cook once said, he said that Cain and Abel were brothers, so they definitely fought. He said, but it wasn't until they mixed God in that they killed each other. Sometimes when people are passionate for God, so you, you cross certain boundaries that you might not otherwise. And so for me, it was, it was really difficult early on to understand that, like, you know, one plus one equals two. And then people say, no, 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 it doesn't. And then, you know, you realize that, like, you know, there's egos and there's other stuff involved. And you've got to be able to speak to people sincerely, you know, make them understand where you're coming from, what you want to do, understand that for some people things could be threatening, even though you don't mean it to be threatening. You know, sometimes, you know, we don't understand the way we come across. We're so passionate sometimes. We think we're being passionate. People think we're being aggressive and it's really one and the same. And I think that, that that's really important. I would say for sure, at this point in my career, you know, earlier on when I was younger, I had a, a little bit of history. A lot of my jobs, I got like a little bit too young and, so I feel, you know, get, like angry and driven and, and stuff. And, you know, I'm definitely a lot um, calmer now in terms of things. I think as you grow older, you get some patience. I think that was, that was an important piece for me. And just realizing that sometimes it may take a little bit extra time, but if you get there in a better way, it's, it's worth the extra time instead of, you know, just basically bulldozing over people. What are the biggest challenges you see facing the Jewish community or the biggest opportunities that you're really focusing on? Could it be, you know, from the macro outside of the Jewish world or within the Jewish world? Look, I think, the, I think the, the biggest problem in the Jewish world is just that uh, people are not connected to their Judaism. And, and in America, it's, it's you know, uh, you know, when I first started, got started with outreach, you know, we started calling something called JSU, the Jewish Student Union, where we'd go to public high schools and we would, uh, we'd reach out to kids. And, and what I came to realize was I think can, was, can you stop? Because I'm sorry, because I, I do that all, all day long, you know, five days a week. How did you start that that concept? What was that like? Oh, JSU. It's like saying I started the light bulb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, JSU was, was was interesting. JSU, we were in Los Angeles, and uh, we we didn't invent clubs. Clubs were there before us. But what happened at the time was the um, the JCCs had had some financial difficulties. They had had some public school clubs, and they kind of. They, they let them go. And uh, we actually went in and we, we picked them up and we started running them. And, you know, it was this concept. You know, NCSY was called the National Conference of Synagogue Youth. And we changed the name to just NCSY. And the reason was because teens weren't showing up in synagogue anymore. You know, and I got a lot of flack from it. You know, one of the one of the rabbis, I remember kind of early on yelled at me because we were doing our classes in Starbucks, not in the local shul. And he's like, you know, it's supposed to be National Conference of Synagogue Youth, not the National Conference of Starbucks Youth, you know? And I said, look, if I do it in the shul, I'll get three kids. If I do it in Starbucks, I'll get 50 kids. And it was this realization that we need to go meet kids where they are, not just sit back and wait for them to come for us because the world had changed. So we started it in LA. What we realized, I was going to mention a statistic before, we realized that there were 30,000 teens at, in Los Angeles at the time. And that if you take Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, Hasidish, Chabad, Beishak, of you name anyone that remotely called themselves Jewish, we had about 5,000 addresses out of 30,000, which meant there were 25,000 Jewish kids that never got a Jewish piece of mail. So for us, and I said this at Federation, I said this at other places, I said, you know, everyone's killing each other over the 5,000. Why don't we just go get the 25,000? I mean, I think in, in the business world, this would be a, a straightforward approach. And so we try to do it. And, and my philosophy is when you do something national, you have to make it fairly simple. You know, like I would go to, uh, to foundations or federations and they would say, well, what's your approach? What's your study? And I said, well, you know, we go in during lunch hour with a lot of kosher pizza and kids come and eat pizza. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's, you know, the hungry Jews. We're just feeding the hungry Jews. And, and that's, you know, one club early on, I remember going to Federation, is in LA, and we brought one of the presidents of our clubs, and they said, well, how many of the kids are affiliated? Yeah, and they're like, what do you mean by affiliate? And they're like, well, how many will go sing on Yom Kippur? This is a club we have about 100 kids connected. And I remember she said, you know, Kippur, you could probably find a good six or seven. You know, so these were, the, the, the Russia Hashanah Yom Kippur Jew was gone, and this was a way for us to get in it, because for unaffiliated Jews, we knew that Monday through Friday, 
you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., we knew where all of our 14 to 17 year old Jews were. And because the Supreme Court has ruled a number of times that you can go into the club during club hour and, and with, you know, with Judaism, Christianity, any kind of religion, it was, to me, it was a little bit no brainer. So that's how we built it. And then we convinced, you know, other people across the country to take it seriously. And, and the best part was, you know, the branding marketing, the fact that we called them all JSU, originally everyone had like different names, but then like there was a kid, I'll never forget, one of the special moments was we had a video call from kids from Los Angeles with kids from Florida. It was in around Boca Raton. And the kids in Boca Raton were scared to do a club, they're nervous this and that. And, and our kids from LA were basically explaining to them how, how they can do it. And like giving them chiza, giving strengthening those kids. Because once you call everything JSU, Everyone had this, you know, interact. Yeah, I attend JSU, you attend JSU. That was it. I mean, that's how we basically built it. I mean, it's, it's people in the Jewish community, in any community, people get too complicated. If you get too complicated, people can't figure out what to do. If you keep it fairly simple, you know, then I think that you can get a lot accomplished. So. What, what's so amazing is that all of these massive empires, of which I'm going to put JSU in, in that category, but if you think about it, and Uber or Home Depot, it's these unbelievably simple concepts that just yeah. kind of people put together that no one really saw before. It's like, oh, you know, taxis and, and GPS, let's try this Uber thing. Right. As someone who is trying to innovate, and again, people will go their whole lives and their whole careers trying to find that one like, you know, moonshot, as I think John Scully from Apple used to call it, right? That one thing that just kind of takes off. Are you trying to find that next thing for yourself? Like, how do you look at, you know, your your career and if you're going to find this new revolutionary concept? I'm always looking for it. Look, you know, one of the greatest biographies I just read was Elon Musk. You know, why is Elon Musk so amazing? Everyone knows Tesla. You have to realize Elon Musk started $4 billion companies, <laughs> okay? Not one, not two, not even three but $4 billion companies. And most people in their lifetime, I mean, who, who gets to start one? And you, and you read it, it's a great book about how he thinks and everything. Uh, the answer is I'm always looking for that concept, meaning I'm always, always, always looking for that concept. Right now at Asia Torah, I'm looking at Discovery. It was by far and away the most widest attended seminar ever in Jewish history. And that's quoting a paper from Rutgers that someone wrote. And uh, the bottom line, what's going to replace Discovery now? So now we're trying to figure that out. What is that next seminar that people can go? And then, you know, you look outside of, of you know, look at a guy like Tony Robbins, right? I went, I went with, actually, um, some of you may know, Charlie Harari, uh, myself, this guy, it works at Apex, gets to know that the three of us went to a, um, a Tony Robbins seminar to understand what this guy does, you know? And it was a whole weekend. We just went Thursday. And, and the guy spoke from 1.30 p.m. to 1.30 a.m., 12 hours straight. You know, I can't sit for more than 30 seconds, you know? And I'm sitting there 12 hours, and then you realize that power, and you're like, well, why is anyone in the Jewish community do it? You see these mega churches, you see all these things going on, and yet the churches, uh, there was a, a rabbi who was, I think it was APEC, Rabbi Muskin told the story in Los Angeles, a great rabbi there, and he said that he was sitting, and there was one of these mega churches, 10,000, you know, family membership stuff, you know. He looks at me, he says, and no breakaways, you know. Like, why can't the Jews stay together? Why is everything, like, every five seconds a breakaway of this or that, you know. Um, and then, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people out there. You talk to a lot of Jews out there, and it's not that they, they're not religiously connected, Jewishly connected. But a lot of them watch Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen is a mega pastor. He's on the line. He goes, he's you know, one of these in Houston, one of these mega stadiums. And, and you'd be shocked at how many Jews will watch Joel Osteen to get spirituality in their lives. And, you know, and he's a fine, you know, pastor. But, like, why can't the Jews and the rabbis and, and why can't we come up with something that's just as good? It's, it's not for lack of material. Our stuff is amazing. The color is amazing. You know, I went to Tony Robbins, and I'm like, that's Kirk Davis, that's Kirk Davis, that, you know, like, the whole thing. And so that, to me, right now, I mean, I'm giving, you know, insider secrets at age, what we're spending all day thinking about, but that's what we're thinking about. What I told someone at age the other day, I said, when we rent out like a Madison Square Garden Stadium and we have like tour classes there and it's packed, I said, then I'll retire. Then I'm, I'm good to go on the next day. It's, it's really a fascinating thing because I also picked up on that and I've been thinking about that a lot. And I guess, do you try to find the fact that it does exist, you know, the, the fact that there are people like him, people that, like the idea, yeah, of a mega church, how do you have thousands and thousands of people that are just, you know, can't, can't wait to come and they're passing out the CDs and everything like that. Do we look at, and I, I may, I don't know if there's an answer for this, but are you looking at human potential as this possibility exists that someone else is doing it somewhere, therefore can we, or are we as Jews trying to find 
something different? Are we not going to try to replicate? Is there a, a, a deeper message we're trying to get? I'm, I have no idea, and I think about this a lot. I, I, look, I think that the only reason it's not working is because no one's done it yet. I mean, that's what a lot of things. That's what, what I think. But, you know, you, you take a look at a guy like Rick Warren, you know, who's another mega uh, pastor. And, you know, he said something that just blew me away. And I, I repeat this often to people. You know, they have services all the time there. And he used to say that it's once a week he would park in the furthest spot from his church and he'd walk right all the way across the parking lot, you know, far distance, because he wanted to think about what it was like for someone that showed up for the first time. You know, so you go to some of these mega churches, right? And you have greeters there and there's people and there's, this is what's going on they, you know, and, and they always, the, the joke is in a synagogue, the most common phrase you're going to hear is you're in my seat, you know? <laughs> and um, I think to a certain extent, I mean, I used to rail against this all the time. The fact that you go into a lot of Orthodox synagogues and you can't find a keeper, you know, there's no keeper box, you know? And uh, I remember one time I was speaking about this and, and a young Orthodox woman said to me, she says, well, but we had no, you know, not from people in our synagogue. I said, well, you know, when you build a building, you, may, you have to, by law, make sure that it, it's able to be accessed by people with disabilities. Someone may never come in there, but if they do, you want to make sure they feel comfortable. And I think that the Orthodox community really needs to feel a little more responsibility for the rest of the Jews, because people have not walked away by choice. That's not the generation we lived in. It's not that people thought very long and hard about Judaism and said, it's not for me. It was never on their radar screen. And I think that that's, it's every you know, connected Jew's job is to basically make that case. As you have such huge aspirations, and it's, it's evident by the fact that you're so fired up about it, do you find yourself getting ever, you know, down that it takes so long, like frustrated about the process? Do, do you feel despondent ever? Or are you completely, I guess you could say, idealistic that, that our best days are in front of us? No, look, I, I take it out a lot on God. You know, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, to me, davening is almost like a, like a side conversation because all day long I'm going back and forth and, you know, uh, I take my frustrations out to him more than anyone because I really view God as my partner, really do. And I'm in this business for him, meaning if he didn't want this, I'd walk out tomorrow. Meaning like this is, this is what I believe he wants. I really do believe he wants that building built, you know, over there, I, I do believe, you know, Mashiach, I, you know, these are the things I believe in. I do believe he wants to use Kish Shabbos. So because he's my partner, I, I do get very frustrated all the time because you can't not, you're trying to do stuff and do stuff and do stuff. And, you know, you have to push it forward. And there's a lot of stuff pushing back. But for me, it's very much about having it out with him, you know, very respectful way, <laughs> because you know, begging him. And, and the truth is, if, if he's not helping me, then that's obviously a deficiency in me, but that means I need to, to reach out more and, and kind of, almost pull him down, you know, to help. Final question. When you are looking back at all of the different things you've accomplished and all the things God willing you will accomplish, your own family, etc., what do you feel like is your greatest legacy or the thing that you're the most proud of? I mean, to me, uh, it's simple. It's my kids. It's my, my personal family. You know, um, everything I do, I'm, I'm very proud of, of Asian, NCSY, and all the things I've done there. I had a big fight with Macabrusa, whether... Sibuka Nefesh is something that a person has to have or not. I mean, I, I actually think that we can't rest on any laurels. So, you know, I don't, I don't focus backwards, I focus forwards. But for me, uh, in my, my wife and my children are the most important thing. And if there was any issue affecting them, they would come before anything else. And I think that that's the, the gift that God gives us is that you have a personal family so that no matter what else is going on in the world, you have that to, you have that to focus on. So it, to me, that's kind of like a, may not be the answer that most people would want, but to me, that's an easy answer. I'm so, I'm so thrilled that you said that. And then how do people either find you or what would you recommend if a person wants to find out about more your mission, Asia Torah's mission, where do they go? Yeah, they just contact me direct. My cell phone number is 646-830-0872. You know, uh, WhatsApp's probably the best way or text. Depends on what country I'm in. I know, you know, I have different phones, different places. My email is, I think, up online, whatever, but it's sburg at you know, you can, I'm happy to talk to anyone. Anyone that wants to join in the mission is, is more than welcome. Like I, you know, I, I can give you a list of people that came here today. It's, it recently, you know, I was joking before about this interview. We had a, a woman that, that works in Iraq, a, a Christian, I don't know, Christian Muslim woman. She was a lot of different things, you know, that came by. She wanted to schmooze. She asked for an interview. I, she, I did a Facebook interview. Um, I don't know where it is because it's going to be mostly in Arabic and stuff. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, like it's, it's uh, any, you know, anyone that wants to join the mission, you know, I think we, we talked earlier about Jewish leaders. I think one of the, the, the mistakes that Jewish leaders make is they try to be untouchable, you know, as far as it gets to me. And this, you know, I'm not, you know, 
I guess I'm not that important, so it's easier to get to me. But I don't, I don't really see what the big deal is. Anyone that wants to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here at one hotel plaza. That's a fairly easy address to remember, you know. But uh, yeah, you know, reach out to me anytime. It's my pleasure. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Rabbi. I appreciate it. Best of luck. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank- there you have it, folks, another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, we have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.